Have you ever got a headache, been stressed or confused when booking a trip? Because there are just too many different mobility apps and options? Did you ever get annoyed about having to sign up to every single transportation app? This is because current urban mobility is fragmented and suffers from a lack of shared cooperation. Blogs Move will allow you to have a seamless journey with one click and one ticket, hassle-free. Your favorite mobility provider will be able to offer you the entire trip in one app using a decentralized technology. From car sharing, e-scooters to trains, and in the future, even spaceships. Use your digital identity to verify yourself once. You can use this identity for all mobility partners in the ecosystem. Pay your ticket in your app and Bloxmove will distribute the money within its network. We are Bloxmove. We provide a seamless and fully integrated mobility blockchain platform for urban transportation. By creating an ecosystem built on alliances, our decentralized platform interconnects mobility service providers such as public transport, car sharing, and e-scooters within one ecosystem. We are not an aggregator. Instead, we offer a seamless and fully integrated journey, one click, one ticket, and hassle-free. We enable service roaming and provide a star alliance for mobility. All this is done securely and efficiently using the blockchain technology while all you have to do is enjoy your trip. Blocks move, reinventing mobility. We carry your passengers further. Hello everyone, this is Alex from Gaines. Today I'm joined by Harry Behrens, who is the CTO, Chairman and Co-Founder of Blocks Move. How are you doing, Harry? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thanks uh, for having me here. It's a pleasure. Please tell us, what are you guys doing at Blocks Move? We're revolutionizing and decentralizing the way mobility is delivered. And as part of that, through the fact that mobility is becoming more and more electric, we are also very deeply engaged in connecting electric vehicles and the power grid in order to create mobility that is not only convenient, but also sustainable, carbon neutral and net zero. Okay, that sounds cool. Why do you need crypto for that? You need decentralized, secure transaction systems for that. The main reason for that is, if you look at what's happening to mobility, it's getting more and more fragmented. What used to be one, two, three companies, and what used to be essentially you buy a car, and that's your way of mobility, is becoming you've got so many different services. It's called modes of service, multimodal services. In order to move from A to B in Paris, in the most convenient and applicable manner, it's not really an option for you to take your car and drive into Paris. You will find no place to park. And no, no, no. it's congested, and they actively limit the way the roads are structured. It's not an option. So you got the obvious ones now. you got the public transport with its advantages and disadvantages. And that was until 10, 15 years ago. But then new mobility came. So you got scooters, you got e-bikes, you got ride hailing taxi, Uber, and all those. So you got about 10 different modes of moving in a city. The product is not this car or that scooter or that subway. The product is the service of, I would like now to move through this beautiful town of Paris at the current pace. So depending on how the weather is, if it's nice and sunny, I have nothing urgent on my mind, I walk. If it's a little bit less, you know, time, uh, free, okay, I might want to pick up a scooter and just cruise a little bit here. Then I want to get across town. I jump into a subway, take a trunk line. Long story short, every single city has now anything between 5 and 20 operators along three or four different modes. And in essence, they deliver pieces of the same product, which is mobility as a service. And then you have a lot of transactions and you have a lot of towns, So, which means this is highly fragmented. And fragmentation and decentralization are very closely connected. So if you got a market and an ecosystem and an environment that is fragmented, then a decentralized approach to it holds much better than a centralized approach. Then on top of that, why crypto? Well, if you this, this is a business of doing business. You're doing transactions where the one party sells, the other party delivers a service, you need to settle, so you need to make sure that everybody gets their money, ideally in real time. And what better system in the world than crypto 
to make sure everybody gets their money according to what is due. Okay, could you explain us how that's gonna enhance the lives of people on a daily basis? Because for example, yes. I can take the subway, I can take an electric scooter, it right. works all fine for now. Why do I need something else? So I'm assuming you're a fairly frequent traveler, at least before Corona. Let's not play the game now, but normally I would tell you, take out your mobile phone and tell me how many mobility apps you have. The expected value is around eight. Probably in your case, it's more. Anything between eight and 20 or 25 different mobility apps on your phone, where each and every time you are presenting all of your data, you need to onboard every time, right? So they will do a face recognition. They will do your credit card. They will do your driving license if it's car, rental, etc. And you need to onboard your data again and again and again. And then you have done those that you have onboarded with. And then you go to another town You find the scooter, all you want is just to hop on that scooter and continue. But no, first download the app, blah, blah, blah. So what about a counter vision? The vision is a vision which you know actually through your mobile phone and it's called roaming. There is many, many, many companies in this ecosystem, the mobile operators. And then one of them, it doesn't really matter which one, has you as their customer and sells you a SIM card. So you are with, I don't know, Orange, is a good possibility. I am with Deutsche Telekom. So they sell me the SIM card and they onboard me one time and give me, they verify my identity, they verify my credentials, and they have my billing relationship. And from that moment on, I don't worry about mobile communication anymore all over the world, no matter who the operators are. I land in Singapore, I land in Dubai, I land in Cairo, I land in London, I arrive in beautiful Paris. These are all operators I've never met. They've never met me. But I seamlessly get my service and the service operator that's delivering me that service, never having met me before, knows they're good for the money. So the answer is, what if we could do service roaming in mobility and do that without the big dragons like Uber and the related acting as a big aggregator, basically taking everybody's customers, making them their own customers and through that offering this, but rather you can sell like Deutsche Telekom in this example, you can sell the service or you can sell the service, but all of your customers can just present their credential, very similar to how you present your SIM card when you go from one service provider to another service provider, the credentials get verified and you just consume the service because then there will be a B2B transaction. The operator that gives you the service will not chase you for the money. They don't know who you are, but rather, They will present an invoice, a charge detail record, a billing record to the company that has originally acquired you as a customer that gave you the SIM card, so to speak, and they will then get paid automatically here. And based on this, a new set of crypto protocols, which are not blockchain, but they are very much the same crypto level. It's called decentralized identifiers and the verification of credentials. This has now become possible. So the advantage would be that you would have one app And the nice thing is, and this is why we liken ourselves to the Star Alliance, you can have the Orange app, I have the Deutsche Telekom app, and that's good enough. You just need one, but any one. It's not the one, not the aggregator, not the big dragon that swallows all of the customers. No, any of the mobility providers in this platform can issue and sell you those tickets. And due to the cryptographic verification methods that are in place here, anybody can then verify it, just like any mobility operator can verify a SIM card and deliver you the service. So you are just chick, 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 think QR code, you scan the QR code on the scooter, your credentials get verified at that point in time. Through the QR code, you send to the platform which of the scooters you're standing in front of, the scooter company verifies, this is all legit, chick, the scooter turns on and you continue. Now that is what we are building. So which partners are you working with? We have an ongoing uh, relationship with Tier. We have an ongoing relationship with Flixbus, which is the world's biggest bus operator. They just bought Greyhound a few months back. We are working with Bondi. We are working with a big European fleet operator called Atlon. It's one of the bigger operators in the Netherlands. And we are working with Energy Web Foundation and 50 Hertz, which is a transmission service operator. In addition to that, 
We are working with two very well recognized banks in Germany, and we are currently part of the SAP IO acceleration with a view on being part of the SAP store. We are also a partner and validator on the Energy Web Foundation. We are a partner of the baseline protocol. We are a partner of ontology. We and considering that we only left the barn doors last May, we're really acquiring partners at a very satisfying rate, I would say. Chair is a huge name and uh, Flexibus, I believe, as well. I'd be curious how these transactions work. Do these companies need the token? Maybe you can tell us more about the token use case in general. Right now, all of these projects are being built. So we will start rolling them out second half of this year. So right now, the taxable income hasn't started yet. We are currently building the pilots. So uh, that also maps with the roadmap we have announced. So for instance, we will switch on mainnet around Q4. And then that is when the actual real revenue will start appearing. In terms of how it works, there's two strategies based on the same technology. The one is, we call it the hybrid strategy. That is the strategy for Europe, China, and the US, which are places which are highly regulated, where anything dreaming of paying a token is incredibly hard to do, so you avoid it. People will be paid in fiat currency on the last mile of the channel. So the B2C part will be fiat. And also people will rely on ultimately ERP systems for the final accounting. So they will not just use like decentralized finance. There is only decentralized finance. There's no bank or anything else. But in a real bank, there is the bank and then there's the payment and then there's the SAP, there's the year in closing. So in these regulated markets, we use hybrid systems because in the end, it's not pure, pure crypto. It is still inside of the same platform and inside the platform only eats BLXM. It doesn't eat fiat. So we're using liquidity pools and treasury. We have a treasury module that makes sure that as we receive uh, transaction fees, which are denominated in euro, those get used to essentially in real time, go into a liquidity pool and buy a corresponding amount of blocks move and those blocks move tokens are the ones you actually slot into the platform to use it easier to imagine and personally we believe in the immediate next five years probably the higher possibly or more dynamic environment are the emerging markets where you can act very similar to how DeFi acts you act purely as a protocol when you interact with other one inch uniswap pancake swap you're not thinking about interacting with the company you don't sign contracts, right? It's decentralized. You have your wallet. They have the protocol. You used it. Money changes hand. And that's it, right? Pure protocol. And we believe this is only possible in the emerging markets. You see that. Europe, US, and China, there's a very strong tendency right now to protect incumbent financial systems, etc., through regulation. We have already announced a roadmap for Nigeria. And in Nigeria, which is one very, very representative and also a very big emerging market, it's also very blockchain savvy. We believe Nigeria is a very good first target to launch pure crypto. And in this one, it will all be based on tokens. Only the B2C relationship, probably, we would still have to deal with if somehow selling prepaid, where you use Naira to get prepaid cards, which then become tokens, but everything else would be on the pure protocol level. And then it's quite simple because the business model is simple. We take a fee per transaction, full stop, and the service gets paid in blocks. So the service gets denominated and stable. It gets, so whatever the price of blocks movies at this point in time, we hand it out. You slot that into the platform. You use the service when the service has been delivered and everybody gets their money. We take a cut from the operator also in blocks. That's the utility. All right. That's very clear. Maybe you can tell us a bit about your background, how the idea came along, what kind of track record knowledge, expertise you have in the mobility or green yeah. tech fields. So I have a diploma, which is a master's, a master degree from the Technical University of Munich, which in the field of computer sciences, since many years, since tens of years, the number one in Germany. I also have a PhD, also in computer science from the University of Tokyo, 
which again is recognized as the number one university, one, one of two, so either Keio and Tokyo University are by far the most recognized universities in Japan. In both cases, the topic was AI. I've worked all my life in small companies and ventures only. And the first time I ever entered the corporate world was 2015, where I joined Daimler Financial Services in Beijing, of all places. And after one year of entering the company, and in this one year, I was in charge of their core systems, retail finance, wholesale finance for vehicles, leasing, financing, and renting. Then I graduated to being in charge of uh, mobility in China. I was also then the last CTO for Car2Go in China. And because I had since 2014 had already on a private level, because there was simply no professional, no job out there in the corporate world that would pay for that, I had consistently studied and worked with blockchain. And I managed to convince the board of management of Daimler Financial Services, they're now called Daimler Mobility, that in the mobility world, we see this continuous fragmentation in services, more and more pay per use, less and less I buy the car and as an object and I use it. People are less and less ownership, but the mobility is measured in person kilometers per year is increasing. Let's use decentralized technologies that have now emerged that allow us to secure business transactions end to end with very little or no integration among the partners, but the level of trust and the degree of security that beats anything you know from the existing banking, factoring, or etc. systems. The board of management accepted the vision and then invited me to headquarter to set up and uh, found and lead a blockchain department. We called it the blockchain factory. The factory wording specifically for we did not ever try to become just another thought think tank group, but it was we were building from the very beginning. During that three years where we built it, it was called the Daimler Mobility Blockchain Platform. And then it became production ready last year. And then, all right, production ready means let's take it to production. Unless Daimler does a whole fundamental change in strategy on who Daimler is, Daimler would not be able to do this as their main core business. But the focus that it needs is that of a company that focuses 100% on such a platform. So we decided, all right, let's spin this out. So we did a management buyout. We bought the software that I had developed as part of my, in my role as the head of the Daimler Mobility Blockchain Factory. It now belongs to us. We went into the Outlier Venture Acceleration Program. Frankly, I do believe Outlier Venture, at least in Europe, is the number one crypto accelerator. I don't know anybody who can compete with them in that segment. And then after that, Basically, we started moving the company. Zofia, our CEO, joined on the 1st of June. I joined on the 1st of July. Then in October, a foundation, the foundry, the BLXM token foundry was founded in Singapore and emitted a token, which is successful. It's the BLXM token. And that is the one that is now behind the whole blocks move ecosystem. How would you say is crypto business and traditional business different? Because for myself, I've basically known only crypto business. So I'm very curious how it is out there. Crypto business, there's a lot more, I call it sentiment. Other people call it vision, whatever you may call it. Whether somebody is successful or not will not be decided by a bookkeeper who knows how to calculate an exit. It gets decided by the vision, by the community, especially there's a strong emphasis on people are willing to take a bet on the future. So people believe that things that are in the future are just as real as things are now, and that the future is better than the present. So even though you don't have anything now, but you present a clear vision towards a prosperous future, people are willing to invest as long as they understand and believe the story. In traditional business, there is the controller, and there is the accountant, and there is the exa. There is the brand name and there are the processes. Things are much more conservative, much slower, and the willingness to invest into what very many cases is radically new ideas is very, very limited. 
There is a book about it, which is almost old by now, The Innovator's Dilemma. So I have my core business. I'm earning billions on my core business. And now you come with a radically new idea, which, because it's radically new, it will always start with zero revenue. Even if you have exponential growth with 0.1 revenue, then you can multiply that quite a lot of times before it even becomes visible. So 0.1 times 2 is 0.2. So if even if you have growth of 100%, over 10 years, you're still negligible. It is therefore not rational for a traditional businessman to put a lot of focus on whatever you're producing there. So even if you're long-term business people, how much difference are you gonna to make to year end closing with your radically new idea? In percentage to what I have in my billions of ongoing business? Well, you're not even gonna be visible when the accountants do the year end closing. That's just a fact of the matter. Plus, you're then getting into the, also the comprehension problem, the mindset. If it's radical, that means it's hard to understand. Now, is somebody who's running a big corporation going to take the time to try to figure out this new radical concept, which anyway right now he already knows for himself, is probably not relevant to his day-to-day -day business. So it's very hard to get a corporation, a big corporation, to bet on a radically new future. But crypto is much more dynamic, much more risk-friendly, but in turn, while you can make a businessman happy with 5% yield per year, he will go home very happy and cash in a big bonus. If you don't deliver whatever APR, I mean, you tell me what your expected APR in the crypto world is, think about it. 2x and 3x in the business world, and 2x do you probably consider low, right? 2x, which is 200%, is unheard of in the business side. In the crypto side, it's well, if you want to be started to take seriously, you better deliver 2, 5, 10x, 10x in the beginning. And if the sustainable part, I want at least 2 to 5x up from you. Otherwise, I'd consider you a failure. That is extremely different. The mindset is very different. What I like about it is it has an incredible sense of wide and artistic freedom. So the spirit of crypto is, it's hard to describe, but it's free. It's, some people might call it libertarian. It's a sense of freedom. People are in what is still unregulated territory, and they like it. They don't want to be regulated. In software, in crypto, we trust the fact are the fact are the fact, and let's just do the things right. And this is something that's unheard of in business. So I can tell you, I do not miss traditional business. Do you think regulations can be bad and really slow down the rate of innovation? Of course. I mean, look at what is happening in China and look at what's happening in the US. I'm not saying it's bad. I don't want to speak about their politicians because I do not know the motives and I'm not a citizen of those countries. It is very bad for crypto. The effect is it stifles innovation. The effect is that crypto is scared of acting in China. The effect is that crypto is scared of selling to uh, American residents. And yes, regulation can be brutal. And especially what's coming out of the US and China lately is from the effect really, really, really slowing down the speed of how much disruption, how much change crypto could be doing. Because people, especially the big money, is still, whoa, 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 whoa. We never know what the SEC or what other regulator is going to do next. So yes, regulation has a big effect, of course. Now crypto is entering the serious level of the financial industry. So it's not on the fringes anymore. Imagine the power of the people that run these industries and imagine their access to the lawmakers and the politicians and just play with it in your mind. I mean, no need to basically be explicit about it, but just think about the industry, think about the heads of that industry, think about the access they have to lawmakers and lobbyists, and then look at the result. I mean, I think it was one of the Buffett guys who said, show me the incentives and I will show you the outcome. Is there anything else you'd like to, to tease about, yes. I don't know, future plans, yes. the roadmap, for example? We're not only the mobility part, but through the fact that the technologies we rely on, which essentially what we do is we provide proof of origin, proof of consent, proof of transaction, and then we settle in a way that is irrefutable. Through the visionary reaction of one of Germany's biggest energy network operators, they're called TSOs, so they're the energy backbone. They're not the ones that deliver the last mile to you, but they are the ones through whose network all the power in the country runs. There's four of them in Germany, and one of them is 50 hertz, and they run essentially the northeast of Germany. 
So that's all connected to them. 18 million Germans essentially are connected to the networks. That's roughly 20% of the population. Here, you have renewable energies. Obviously, in Germany, we don't consider nuclear power renewable energy in Germany. So renewable energy is only wind and sun. And there is a very strong push, of course, to make the power generation renewable. And Germany is quite far. We are currently 47, almost 50% of all power being used in Germany is already based on renewables. Renewables are very different from nuclear or coal or oil. When you have nuclear or oil or coal, you have the stuff that you will burn sitting there somewhere, and then you turn the machine up or down, and that's a nuclear power plant, that's a coal power plant, etc. You can always react to the demand by just turning the wheel. With renewable energy, that's not the case. The wind blows when the wind blows, the sun shines when the sun shines, either you harvest it or it's gone. But a network is not a storage system. So if you give, and Germany does that, we pay more for renewable energy. And in order for you to be safe in your investment decisions, we guarantee you unlimited feed-in into the power grid. And that creates situations, and more and more often, where there is more power being fed into the network than there is demand. And that creates the absurd situation of something called negative power prices where not only does the power grid have to pay for the power, but in order to avoid explosion, they have to then offload the power to neighboring countries, France and Belgium and Holland, and not only offload it, no, pay for it. So first we pay to generate the power, and then we pay for it to be given away. Traditionally, water was used to balance this. So you would use electricity to pump water up a hydraulic plant, and then when you need it back, it's like a bank, then you let the water run down again and we recoup some of this electricity. And this goes so far, and this was announced four, five, six months ago, we built a cable for many, many billions of dollars from Germany to Norway, so that now we can also pump water up the hill in Norway. So when we have uh, energy supply pipes, now in Norway, people start basically pushing water up the hill so that when we need it back, they let it roll down the hill again and give us the power back. But if you realize that one electric car has roughly the energy capacity of a one family house, and now if you think about also that we expect 10 million, 20 million, 30 million electric vehicles on Germany's roads alone in the next 10 years, then all of a sudden, if you also know what vehicle to grid means, and the fact that when an electric car is charging, it becomes physically a part of the power sector, obviously, because the battery is now connected to the power grid. It's not a mobility asset anymore at that moment. It's a part of the power sector. And that is, by the way, why we call our company power and mobility, because we are working towards a vision where power and mobility is converging. They're being coupled. So you have a financial product which exists. It's not very known. You need to know somebody in the energy business. They will confirm this. It's called flexibility. It's essentially an option. It's called put and call option product for energy, which means companies pay for the fact that think of I have a battery, two million kilowatt hours, and it's half full. That's the easiest way. Then I can sell you a million kilowatt hours of flexibility, which means if you have excess, I can take, swallow a million kilowatt hours. If you have demand, I can give you a million kilowatt hours. And this is a multi, multi billion dollar product in the energy sector. It's known, it's just not known outside. And here it's very clear that mobility will be one of the great benefit, beneficiaries of this. Because once you manage to combine and aggregate electric fleets and provide them in wholesale to the power sector as is in place of pumping water up the hill, as storage systems or as flexibility buffers, then you have a very clear business case where the money is flowing out of the power sector into the mobility sector. It's a very clear story, and it contributes on top of that also to carbon neutral and net zero mobility. And on top of that, there's even more products coming which are closer to your pocket. Think about you have an electric car. That probably means you're somewhat concerned or interested in being friendly to the environment with your electric car. If I already do that, I drive emission free, then the thinking would go, wait a second, but now I get electricity into my car, which was generated in coal. No, I don't want that. If I want to be carbon neutral or sustainable, I also want the power 
that I put into my car to be based on regenerated energy. The only way you can do that is if you have this end-to-end, very detailed, decentralized, proof of origin, proof of transaction, so that you can actually prove that the power that is being fed into your car is indeed the power that was generated by this windmill or that solar panel. That is the product which we are currently developing jointly together with the Energy Web Foundation. It's more than mobility. It's electric mobility. It's a whole mindset where the power sector is decentralizing, mobility is decentralizing, and all of a sudden you've got these hybrid cases where is this mobility, is this power, is the electric car a mobility asset, or is it because of its battery a power asset? So this is the truly visionary part in which we have the chance to be very much at the center and at the forefront, because we've been working on this for two or three years by now, so we're really deep in it, and when this will come, we will be one of the players that will be active in this because we just have an incredible advantage in this case. Bloxmove is going to decentralize mobility, but we will decentralize electric mobility. And our actual vision is the vision that's also the name of our company to decentralize power and mobility. Thank you so much, Harry. I have to say this was one of the most interesting and calm interview with lots of knowledge and also, you know, took some unexpected turns. I almost feel like I want to keep chatting with you on the topics. It was really interesting to learn about how the, the whole grid works for a renewable, storing the energy with water and how you, you plan to, to go into that. I'll put all the links to Blocks Move Power Mobility in the description. It was a pleasure having you. If you guys liked the video, you can drop a like, subscribe, check out what uh, these guys do. Have a great day and thank you again. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.